bachelor degree from Morgan State University. Uh, his research is dedicated towards understanding and modeling the relationship between the performance of build infrastructure systems and the ability of communities to minimize the extent of socio-technical disruption following natural hazard events. Dr. Barton is a registered structural engineer in the state of California and has several years of professional practice at Degen Golf Engineers, where he worked on numerous projects involving design of new buildings, seismic evaluation, retrof and retrofit of existing buildings. He's a recipient of the National Science Foundation Next Generation of Disaster Researchers Fellowship in 2014 and the National Science Foundation Career Award in 2016. Uh, without further ado, please welcome Dr. Henry Barton uh, for his speech. Thank you, Luis. Um, so if I can just get a confirmation that you're seeing uh, the slideshow. Uh, no yet. Not yet? OK. Um, hold on a sec. Let me see. OK, now I can see it. OK. All right. Um, yeah. So thanks, thanks, uh, Luis, for that for that introduction. Um, so, so as Luis mentioned um, today, I'm going to talk a little bit about the research that we're doing in our group on um, machine learning applications in earthquake engineering. Um, just a quick overview of my presentation. I'll start by just giving an overview. Of, of machine learning, what it is um, for, for, for those that are less familiar. Um, and the next, next I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna talk about three different areas where uh, we have started um, uh, applying machine learning in, in uh, within the context of earthquake engineering. And then I'll, I'll wrap up by giving some final thoughts on some of the challenges and opportunities moving forward. So, to start, I thought I would um, make the distinction between artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning. Um, I think, you know, even he here in the US, th there's a lot of um, people sort of use these things, um, into these terms interchangeably, but they're, they're, they're actually pretty distinct, right? Um, so artificial intelligence is sort of this broad category uh, of technologies that allow machine that, that that allow machines to perform uh, functions that are associated with the human mind, so things like perceiving, re reasoning, and learning, and problem solving. Um, machine learning is actually just one type of or one branch of artificial intelligence, right? So it uses algorithms to find patterns in data, and it, and it, and then it tries to make predictions about the future. Right, so essentially, what it does, it, it it enables computers or machines to make or to learn without re receiving uh, explicit programming instructions. And uh, there are three uh, major types of machine learning: supervised, supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning. I'll talk about those a little bit more in a sec. And then the final, which is the le and, and then the final one, which is probably the one that you hear the most about, um, deep learning, which is actually a branch of machine learning, um, where uh, it specifically it uses uh, neural networks. Uh, to do the to do the prediction and 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 the success of deep learning is is one of the things that has sort of uh, popularized um, machine learning um, in different in different fields. Um, so in terms of the types of machine learning, so I mentioned one type is supervised learning. So this is where uh, you use uh, um, it, this is where you use uh, you train the model to be able to de detect patterns and predict uh, values. So for example, one example I'll talk about uh, later on is predicting the drift capacity of reinforcement concrete walls. That's an example of, of supervised learning. Uh, unsupervised learning is where you're just trying to, un un you're trying to explore the unlabeled data without making any explicit uh, predictions, right? So for example, um, you might have a set of buildings that you're trying to place in uh, in subgroups uh, based on some type of similarity. You're not trying to predict. You're not trying to do a prediction. You're just trying to put them in groups based on some predefined similarity. So that would be like unsupervised learning. And then uh, reinforcement learning, which is which is the least uh, popular of the three, 
um, uh, we are actually doing some research in this area. I'm not going to talk about it today, but this is where, um, again, you're trying to detect patterns, um, but you're actually performing a task um, or you have some agent within the computer program that's performing a task where it maximizes the reward it receives for for its action. So basically, you're 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 trying to train some agent to optimize some set of actions by having it interact with an environment and receiving rewards and penalties based on how it interacts. So 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 one example is finding the sequence of pipe repairs in an earthquake damage water network that's actually some work that we're doing right now it's not it's not it's not quite ready for for showtime yet but um but that's and that's that's an area of reinforcement learning that we're we're working in um so today uh what i'm going to present and i would i would argue that most of the work that's being done in in within the earthquake engineering community related to machine learning is is with supervised learning so i'll talk a little bit more about the types of supervised learning Right, so regression. So if you've taken a statistics class, you've heard this, you've heard of regression before, right? So this is where um, your predictions, the outputs from your predictions or your response variables, these are continuous variables. So, so if you're trying to predict uh, drift, drift capacity of concrete walls, drift demands in steel moment frames, collapse capacity of buildings, uh, these are all um, uh, continue, these are typically defined as continuous variables. So this would be like a regression problem. Uh, classification is the case where you have the output or response variables that are categorical, right? So for example, if you're trying to predict the state of damage of a structure after an earthquake, or you're trying to predict uh, the likely failure mode in a, in a, re, in a, in a reinforced concrete wall, uh, these are examples of classification problems. Okay, so I'm going to bear with me for a while. I'm, I'm going to get a little bit into, into the math that's involved in specifically within supervised learning, which is which is what I'll mostly talk about today. Um, so the basic machine learning problem seeks to uh, minimize um, or, or seeks to develop some function that gives prediction that minimizes the what's called the loss between the predictions and the actual values. Right, so in this in this in this equation, the thing we're trying to predict is the yi. That's the response variable, and you have uh, a set of observations of that response variable, and then you're trying to develop some function that predicts the response based on some set of features, right? And that that what is shown as f of x i theta is the machine learning model, and where theta is some set of some set of model parameters. So you you actually try to you try you're trying to optimize these parameters to minimize that loss that loss function as part of the process of building the machine learning model. And then uh, the fee is just the loss measure. So that's the, that's the thing that quantifies the difference between the predictions from the machine learning model and the, and the actual values. And, that, and, so, and so that loss is what you're trying to minimize. And then for some models, there's this regularization term. So the lambda omega with the phi in the parentheses, with the, with the theta in the parentheses, that's a regularization term where some models actually penal, some, in some models, you would penalize the model based on its complexity um, through some regularization function. And um, lambda in this case is, is also a set of uh, parameters that are de determined by, by the process. Um, so I mentioned before that the machine learning problem is set up such that um, you would try to minimize some loss function. So this is typically an empirical loss function because you're trying to you're trying to minimize the loss involved in predicting a set of training data, right? That's why it's called an empirical loss function. Um, and, um, and yeah, so basically you're trying to get the set of the, the set of parameters theta that would minimize that loss function over your training data, which is defined, which is defined as D. Um, and so I think we're all, uh, if, if, you've take, if you've taken a basic, even undergraduate statistics class before, uh, you're familiar with ordinary least squares regression, which arguably is, arguably is the simplest form of uh, supervised learning. So in OLS, our loss function is just the residual sum of squares, right? And, um, and, and the residual sum of squares 
is just shown by 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 the equation um, um, there. It's it's basically it's basically just the square of the residuals, where the, the residuals is the difference between the predicted value and the actual value, right? So so that in in, in the in the context of an OLS model, our loss function is that R R S S, and the procedure of fitting an OLS model is to find a set of parameters. So what we saw as theta before is actually our OLS coefficients. We're trying to find a set of coefficients that would actually minimize that loss function or that R RSS. And, and we know that for OLS, that's actually a closed form solution. Now for most, or for a lot of uh, the more advanced machine learning algorithms, um, that process of minimizing that loss function is, is, is typically not a closed form solution. There's various com computational techniques uh, that are involved and I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit about them. But I think looking at sort of supervised learning within the lens of, of ordinary least squares regression is a good way to sort of start to wrap your mind around uh, some of the more ad ad advanced techniques. So there are some other there are some other sort of subtasks that are involved in building a machine learning model. So feature selection, right? So the features are your input variables. I'll be using those ter those terms interchangeably, right? So so one of the one of the first tasks is figuring out okay which which input variables you think would uh, would make good good predictors um, or would inform the prediction of your response variable or your output. Um, in some cases, it might be necessary to do some transformation of those input variables, um, and so and so that's so so that's where the concept of, of feature ex extraction comes in. And then you would train your model. Um, that's where you basically de determine that set of parameters that minimizes the loss function, and then you would assess the performance of your model um, based on some on, on some preferably unseen data set, meaning if you have a data set, you would separate it into a training set, you would use it to build a model, and then you would evaluate on some testing set that was not used in, 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 in the model training. And what that does it is, it is, is, it is that it improves the generalizability of your model um, because now you're testing it on, on a data set that, that it, it, it has not seen at least in, within the training process. Okay, so now getting into some uh, some uh, some specific uh, applications. Um, so here I'm going to start by talking about using machine learning to predict seismic structural component re response using empirical data. So so a natural first question is why why use machine learning for this? Right, I think one of the things that you'll see is because machine learning is becoming so popular, people are just sort of it's it's being used just for the sake of it. So so I think within the earthquake engineering community, I think we really sort of have to ask ourselves the question, does this provide a tangible benefit in terms of the procedure or the process or the or the or the model that we're that we're that we're trying to develop relative to the relative to more conventional methods, right? I think that has to be that has to be our starting point. So so if we think about um, um, sort of these structural response uh, uh, models based on empirical data within structural engineering or within earthquake engineering, there's a long history of using empirical models to predict behavior, right? Based on empirical data, right? Um, so, and, and that's often done when, um, you know, we understand the physics, but maybe trying to represent the physics in an analytical equation or in a mechanics-based equation is not, it's, 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 it's not uh, trivial, it's not straightforward. Um, and so we use, so, so we would do some physical tests and then we would fit the data from, that, from those experiments to some, to some statistical equation, right? So in that case, you can argue, well, if you're already gonna use uh, a statistical model, an empirical model, then it, wouldn't, it might make sense to see if you can improve the predictive performance of that model um, of, of those more conventional statistical met methods using machine learning, right? So, so, the, so there is there might be an opportunity for a tangible benefit. So, in this particular application, we're we're interested in predicting the drift capacity of reinforced concrete walls with special boundary elements um, using machine learning. And so, what we did is we started with a model. Uh, a, a fairly straightforward uh, empirical equation that was developed 
by Abdallah and Wallace here at UCLA. Um, as, as some of you all may know, Professor John Wallace, he's, he's one of, one of um, at least in the US and I would say uh, um, internationally, um, uh, known researchers for reinforced concrete structures, right? So him and his student, uh, they developed this empirical equation. So, so, so they, so they collected this uh, data set of experiments car carry out both within uh, UCLA, but as part of um, 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 other other research as well around the world. Uh, they connect. They, they created this data set of. Well, the, the, the overall data set itself is pretty large. It has over uh, a thousand uh, experiments of different types of concrete walls. But for this particular model, um, they were only interested in walls with special boundary elements. So the data set comprised of uh, 164 experiments, right? And so they basically, so, so you know, they did a number of things. They looked at which um, structural parameters are, are most highly correlated with the drift capacity. And they found that uh, things like the, sl the slenderness ratio Ratio, which is shown by lambda b, which is basically just a combination of the slenderness associated with the width of the wall and the and the depth of the neutral axis, as well as the length of the wall um, related to the to the depth of the to the depth of the neutral axis. Um, and also, uh, there's another parameter in there, alpha, that's related to um, Related to the related to the shear reinforcement, whether you have overlapping hoops or single hoops with cross ties, um, and then the other parameters include the shear stress um, normalized by ten times square root of f prime c. So, so that 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 ratio is is a ratio that you see quite a lot in um, in 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 the build in the in ACI three three eighteen. Um, when it comes to designing and, and assessing the performance of reinforced concrete walls, right? So this is the equation that was developed by Abdallah and Wallace. And we wanted to see if we can improve the predictive performance of this type of model using uh, machine learning. And actually the, this particular step, what I'm gonna talk about Professor Wallace is actually also um, involved in this, in this work. So this slide gives an overview of the workflow for the development of the machine learning model. Um, a lot of these steps are applicable to um, just developing machine learning models in general. So selecting your features, uh, selecting which algorithm you're gonna use. In this case, we use an algorithm called extreme gradient boosting or XGBoost. Um, you have to figure out what metrics you're gonna use to evaluate the performance of your models. You train and tune the hyperparameters. So the hyperparameters are uh, what was represented by the theta and the lambda um, in the in the earlier slide. And then in this particular case, we were interested in comparing uh, the performance of the SGBoost model with the Abdallah and Wallace model. And then we also want to be able to um, see whether or not it's possible to interpret. Uh, or how well we can interpret the machine learning model. So, so, so one of the challenges with machine learning model, especially for engineering applications, you know, as engineers, we're used to understanding, especially as structural engineers, as earthquake engineers, we're we're used to we're used to when we have when we have analytical equations, it gives us a clear sense of 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 how the various input variables relate to the outcome so it's easier to interpret the model with machine learning models it's 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 a bit more of a challenge because some of the models are are somewhat of a, a black box well i want to be careful there because there are some models that are truly black boxes like neural networks meaning a lot of times they can't even be explained by people that are machine learning experts um, but then there are other models like xgboost which we can actually offer some explanation, um, even though it's an algorithm that uh, maybe a lot of structural engineers are not familiar with, but if you understand the algorithm, you can extract some, some, some explanation uh, from it. So in the next few slides, I'll just talk about the things shown in red. I'll talk a little bit about the XGBoost algorithm, the, the performance metrics that we use to evaluate the models, and then the comparison between the XGBoost and the Abdallah and Wallace model, and then a little bit on the, and a little bit on the interpretation. So, um, okay, so just really quickly about the XGBoost model, I'm not gonna go into too, too much of the equations. I mean, I mean too, too much of the details, but XGBoost, so extreme gradient boost, boosting, it's called, uh, it's referred to as an ensemble model. And that just means it's basically a combination of, of a number of different models. 
right? It's also in this category of models that are called uh, dec decision trees, right? So in a decision tree, what happens is you just have this piecewise division of the of the data while generating uh, predictions locally, meaning at each of the various nodes um, and each of each of the various branches. So what XGBoost does it, it uses multiple it, it uses multiple it uses multiple iterations of these uh, of these decision trees, but it uses them in sequence, right? Meaning you build one tree. Uh, you have a predictive model, you have the residuals or the errors from that model, and then you use another tree to build a model, you build a predictive model for those residuals or, or those errors, and you keep doing that uh, incrementally, and eventually you get a model that would perform uh, much better than if you just use uh, one tree or, or trees that were, that were maybe uh, independent, right? So, so so that's so that's the XGBoost model, and 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 if you have additional questions on that, you can feel feel free to ask. So again, as I said before, you have to you have to have metrics that you can use to evaluate whether you're getting adequate performance of the model, or if you're comparing the performance of multiple models, as we're doing here. Um, so to, so the first metric here is the root mean square error. If you if you've done any type of uh, statistical analysis, even, even with conventional statistical models, you may have seen this one. So the root mean square error RMSE, that's just the square root of the average of the square of the errors. And again, the errors are just the difference between the actual value, the actual observation value and the value that you would get from your prediction. Um, so that's one type of metric. That metric is used a lot. It's good for comparing uh, the results of two different models. But as you'll see later, it's hard for us to look at an RSME for a single model. And as a structural engineer say, um, just based on that number, I have, you know, it, it, I can get a sense of how trustworthy that model is. It, it's, 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 it's a lot, it's, 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 as you'll see later, it's, it's difficult to do that just with, with RMSE. Um, the R squared um, is one that, again, that's one that's used a lot in statistics. That's just the that's just the proportion of the variance um, in the data set that's predictable by by the model. And um, again, that doesn't really give you a set, that doesn't give you a measure of predictive power. Again, it really just tells you how much of the variance in the data is captured by the model, right? So it's good in some sense. Um, it's a good number to check, but but you always have to keep in mind it doesn't really it, it, it's not always correlated with the predictive performance. So the third metric is actually something that we came up with. Um, um, so it's we call it DXUXXO, and essentially it's the it's the fraction of predictions that fall within some. With, with that satisfies some condition that is based on the ratio between the predicted and the actual value. So for example, let's say we set uh, XO and XU to be equal to 0.1 or 10%. That would mean the D value would be the fraction or percentage of predictions that are within 10% of the actual value. And that could be 10% higher. So it can be as high as 110% or 10% lower. So as low as 90%. Now the advantage of this metric one, is that I think if I, I, I think I can, ex, I can describe this hopefully to someone who is, who is not involved in machine learning, uh, maybe someone involved in making a decision, making decisions about whether this model is accurate. And I think I can, I can sort of explain it in such a way that it's intuitive, right? So, so it's, it's a, you can think of it as a probability that the ratio of your predicted to actual would be within some, within some range. And the other advantage is that you can actually define the X U and the X naught to be, uh, to be different so that you can actually put a stricter tolerance on, a, on a, a either under predictions or over predictions. So for example, if we're predicting drift capacity, you might want to you might want to specify the x uh, the x u, which is where you're under predicting, to be uh, more strict than uh, x o, right? Because um, if it's a capacity, you're probably you probably want to ensure, it, or you're 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 going to be worse off with under predictions than if you are with with uh, than than if you are with with uh, with over predictions. Um, 
So this slide shows a, comp a, a comparison of uh, between the two between the two models, right? The XG boost on the left, the Abdallah and Wallace model on the right. I think the, the so so the, so these are plots of the 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 observed drift capacity on the horizontal axis, the predicted drift capacity on the vertical axis. The diagonal line represents the cases where the observed and the predictive are the same. So the, so the more uh, clustered you are around that diagonal line, the better the performance. So I think immediately you can see just visually that the XG boost model performs better, but you can look at that in terms of, of these different metrics. So the RS, RMSE is 0 0.233 versus 0.385. Right. Remember, I was saying later, I mean, it's lower, but 0.233 relative to 0.385, how much lower is that? It's, it's hard to really say. Um, the R squared is higher, which means that the variance in the XG boost model um, is better captured or the variance in the data is better captured by the XG boost model. Um, but if you look at the D 10%, right? So we're using 10% for both the upper and lower. In this case, it's 76, it's 0.76 for the XG boost and it's 0.53 for the Abdallah and Wallace. So that means that whereas the XG boost model, there's about a 76% probability that you would be, be within 10% of that. If, if you're looking at it as a ratio, you're within about 10% of the observed value. There's a 76% chance of that. With the Abdallah and Wallace model, that it, that goes down to about 53%, right? So I think for someone, again, that's maybe you're, you're, you're someone that's involved in code development, I think you can take that number and, and, and start thinking, okay, is it worth, um, uh, you know, challenges with interpretability and all that? Is it worth it um, in terms of this improvement in, in predictive power? The other thing I talked about is that we want to be able to interpret uh, these models, right? And while it's while it's not obvious, um, well, so I should say, so one of the challenges with the XG boost model is that because it's a tree-based model, you can't write it down, right? It's it, 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 there's no analytical equation involved, so that means so that begs the question of can you put it into a building code? And I think that's a larger question that we're just starting to think about, right? If you have a model that's purely computational, meaning you can't put an equation associated with it. Can you put it into a building code, right? And and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna tackle that question um, uh, right now. I think that's something that's just starting to come up. But what we can do with the XG boost model is we can start to look at, at we can we could start to interpret the model, right? So for example, um, here this shows the relationship between uh, three of the parameters: the slenderness ratio, the shear stress ratio, and the and the and the transverse reinforcement. And on the horizontal axis shows uh, shows the effect on drift capacity. So to the right means that that variable increases the drift capacity. To the left means it decreases the drift capacity. And then the colors, the red means a high a high a high uh, a high value of that variable. Blue means it's low. So if we just start with the slenderness ratio, the lambda b, the red part is to the left, meaning a high slenderness ratio is associated with a lower uh, drift capacity, which I think if, you, if, you, if you've worked with uh, reinforced concrete walls and you understand how do you perform, how they perform, um, that makes sense, right? So if the wall is more slender, it's gonna have a lower drift capacity. Um, similarly, this, the shear stress ratio, right? So the higher the shear stress ratio, right? The red parts of that are to the left. So the red parts are associated with a higher shear stress ratio Again, that's associated with a lower drift capacity. And again, um, if, you, if you're familiar with how uh, reinforced concrete walls perform, that, that makes sense. The, convert, the, the, the type of reinforcement, that one is a little bit trickier because that's actually a categorical variable. And the way you incorporate categorical, categorical variables in regression, it's a little bit different in, in the interest of time. I'm not gonna get into the details. Um, feel free to ask if you have a question at the end, but essentially, you, if you look at this table to the right, it shows that the lower numbers are associated with overlapping hoops, which is sort of better uh, transverse reinforcement co configuration. And the higher numbers are, are related to single hoop without legs, which is uh, undesirable um, 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 transverse reinforcement. So it shows that, again, the high numbers are to the left. Right, so high numbers, meaning the number is closer to five and the number of 
associated with five represents the type of transverse reinforcement that you would not want to have want to have in seismic applications right so that that's associated with a lower drift capacity so so again makes makes sense um here we're we're looking at another level of interpretation so again we're still looking at the relationship if you look at the upper left hand plot we're still looking at the relationship between the slenderness ratio and the effect on drift capacity positive means it's increasing the drift capacity negative means it's not but we're also able to see the effect of the shear stress ratio we're able to see how the shear stress ratio affects how much the slenderness ratio influences drift capacity right so the first thing we see is one yes as the as the slenderness ratio um, increases the drift capacity decreases one of the things you see here is that it's actually a nonlinear relationship which tells us something that may that tell that tells us that the linear model there's something that the linear model wasn't capturing um, but if you look at if you look at drift if you look at slenderness ratios that are very low you would see that there's a range for example if you look at a slenderness ratio of about about seven you'll see there's sort of a vertical range in the associated drift capacity. And that actually means that there's something else other than the slenderness ratio that's affecting the drift capacity or some, or, or there's another variable that's influencing how much the drift capacity affects the, how much the slenderness ratio influences the drift capacity, right? So we see here that the blue lines are associated with lower shear stress ratio, right? And that means that, and, and so, at a lower shear stress ratio, you have a higher drift capacity associated with any given, um, with a given uh, slenderness ratio. Um, uh, here I'm doing something similar, but in this case, we're interested in the shear stress and we're looking at the effect of slenderness ratio. How much does that affect the shear stress ratio effect on drift capacity? Okay, so now I'm gonna move on to another application which is developing target models for system level seismic response and performance quantification uh, using simulation data. So again, we want to start with this question of why, right? We don't want to just use uh, the machine learning just for the sake of it. Um, you know, you want to have some motivation. So, so the mo motivation in this case is, is uh, the performance-based seismic design procedure which, which you, you may be familiar with. So the way it works is uh, you set some performance objective for your building that could be based on reliability, resilience, life cycle cost. You do a preliminary design. You assess the performance using some metrics. So the second generation uh, PBE framework is one that we work with a lot. You check to see if your performance meets the objectives. If it does, then you finalize the design. If it doesn't, you, re you revise the design. And there's this iterative process here, right? And if, and if you're doing the second generation PBE, it means that you need nonlinear responses to be able to get losses, right? And so this iterative process could be, could be computationally expensive and, and, and also labor uh, intensive. And, um, and so one strategy is to develop surrogate models, machine learning models that can give you that relationship between uh, various design variables and the predictive outcome, right? Such that you don't have to do that iteration explicitly. You can do it with the machine learning model. And then when you're checking your final design, you can do that explicitly with, with your physics-based model, right? Um, so, uh, here, this just shows uh, some previous work on seismic de demand estimation and, and highlighting some of the limitations. So there's been a lot of mechanics-based models developed, um, um, a lot of them by Professor Miranda's group at, at, at uh, Stanford. Um, there are a lot of challenges with, with, with these models. One of them is that they, oftentimes you have to make these, these simplifying assumptions um, um, that uh, that could affect the predictive performance of the model. Um, if you look at a lot of these, a lot of this work, the evaluation of the performance was typically just on just a small handful of buildings. Um, and oftentimes there are some coefficients that need to be calibrated. So you still sort of require doing nonlinear response history analysis to do that calibration. Um, there's this idea of a hybrid model, meaning it's a model that's sort of partially data-driven and partially mechanics-based. 
um, and we'll talk about, we, we developed uh, such a model. Um, I think in terms of the prior work, the main limitations had to do with the fact that you never had a complete model, meaning you would sort of build a procedure for getting a model, but there'd be some coefficients that need to be calibrated that weren't sort of done as part of those models. And then there's a purely data-driven model. So this is a model where you have input parameters that are related to the, to the design and you get a prediction of the seismic uh, the seismic demand. So, so there's no uh, linear elastic analysis or anything like that that's involved. There's no, there's no equivalent single degree of freedom uh, type of thing. Uh, these models could be difficult to interpret, but as I showed earlier, depending on the algorithm, while the interpretation may not be straightforward, you can actually interpret these models um, if they're developed in the right way. So really quickly, um, I'm gonna go through the procedure that we use. So we developed a seismic demand, specifically drift demand estimation model for steel special moment frame buildings. Uh, the main steps included, uh, so we built a database of, uh, of over 600 um, uh, special moment frames. And the idea here is that A, we need a, we need a, we need a, a reasonably sized data set to be able to build a model, but also we wanted, we wanted to do a, a rigorous evaluation of the model. So we wanted sort of a, a diverse set of designs to be able to evaluate the model. Um, so we built a couple of different types of models. One model was purely data driven, right? Meaning you put into the model uh, structural parameters related to the building, you get drifts. Another model was what we call hybrid, meaning you might do say uh, a, a, a linear elastic analysis of the MDOF, you might get some elastic drifts and you're actually using the machine learning model to get you from those elastic drifts to the actual, uh, actual nonlinear drifts. And then uh, we also uh, compare the performance of our model uh, with some of the some of the exist the models in the existing literature. Um, so what I'm showing here, I call this the spectrum of possibilities in terms of developing the mo these models. On the left end are mo models that are purely mechanics based, right? So for example, Professor Miranda developed a set of models that are based on shear and flexural beam theory. Um, there are also some models that are based on elastoplastic single degree of freedom systems uh, with no yield strength. So these are all mechanics based. And then on the right end are the data driven models. Again, these are models where you put in uh, the, 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 the structural parameters of the building and you get a response. And then somewhere in the middle, there's a hybrid model um, where you know, the user is going to have to do some, some type of intermediate analysis. It might be a linear elastic and equivalent, um, uh, a linear elastic analysis, maybe either based on response spectrum analysis or maybe based on um, equivalent lateral forces. And, um, and then your, your, your machine learning model gets you from sort of that, that elastic response to the nonlinear response of the, MDO, of the MDOF. Um, so some details of the, of the development of our model. Um, I'm not going to go through the details of these steps. A lot of these steps are, 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 are similar to what we did for the drift capacity model. You need data. Um, you need to figure out what your, what your features are, what your input variables are. You train your model, you evaluate it. Um, so same steps here, uh, or similar set of steps here. In this case, we actually use a different type of predictive model. This one is called random forest. Like XGBoost, it's a, it's, a, it's a model that's based on decision trees, right? So you still have this um, recursive subdivision of the data set um, based on some set of decisions and consequences. Um, but the difference between XGBoost and random forest is for XGBoost, you're, you're developing, you're building these trees sequentially and the creation of one tree depends on the residuals from the previous one. Whereas in, in random forest, it's just a set of randomly developed trees that are aggregated to give you one prediction, right? And depending on the context, depending on the problem, one model might give, might give you a better performance than the other. Um, these are the features or input variables that we considered initially. Um, so features related to the just build general building information, number of stories, number of bays, uh, the width of the bays, dead load, live load. Uh, one set of features related to modal analysis, right? So 
this would actually require the user to actually do some type of analysis or so spectral intensity parameters. And then on the far right, there's some nonlinear pushover analysis um, um, features. Now, keep in mind, as you start from the left, the ones on the far left are the easiest features as a user, as a designer, these are the easiest things to get, right? The number of stories, number of bays, a dead load, live loads, you don't have to do any analysis to get this information. But as you move further and further to the right, the type of analysis that you need to use to get you to the features that require becomes more and more complex. And we'll see the implication of that a little bit later. Uh, so one of the things that we did is we started with a large set of features, I believe uh, 30, 19, 29, 35 features, um, but we wanted to sort of understand which of the features were more important. Um, so we computed what's called an important score. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna get into the details of it, um, but basically we saw that things like the height ratio, um, the first mode, um, uh, the first mode period, um, some of the first and second mode spectral parameters um, were were some of the more were some of the more um, the more important features. Okay, so this slide shows the workflow for developing the purely data driven model, right? So remember, these are models that are just taking taking um, information about whatever features you're using. You build your model you get your prediction. There's no intermediate step. Um, so, so, sorry, there's no, um, there's no intermediate uh, um, uh, analysis that's, that's, that's required here, right? Um, in this case, let me, let, me, let, me, let me say that again. In the purely data-driven model, you're going directly from features, whatever features they are, to the seismic drift demand. In the hybrid model, there's this intermediate step where you have to first develop elastic drift demands from, a, from an MDOF. And, um, and you're actually using the machine learning model to get you the relationship between these elastic drift demands and the story drift demands from nonlinear response history analyses, right? So this actually requires that the user would do some type of uh, some type of analysis to be able to use this model. And so, 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 so this is what I was getting at. So, so this is the workflow for using these different types of models. So the one in the middle is uh, machine learning data driven, right? So, so here uh, you need some model analysis parameters um, um, and you directly get the drift demand. The one on the right, that's the hybrid model. Here you actually need to build uh, uh, an elastic MDOF model. You have to get elastic story drift demands. And then the machine learning gets you an amplification factor that gets you to the nonlinear uh, drift demands. Whereas on the far left, the one in the purple, that one's pretty much the same as the one in the middle, except we're using less predictors. And the difference here is that where the one in the middle, it still requires a modal analysis. So you still have to do an eigenvalue analysis, right? You don't need to get any elastic drifts, but you still need an eigenvalue analysis to get you some modal information. Whereas the one on the left is less information you need. That's one. That's the one where you basically are just using um, um, this these building information features. Okay, so uh, this slide just compares uh, the performance of um, the various models. So the PSKY model, so remember that's the elastoplastic SDOF with no yield strength, that actually performed poorly, right? Um, this is, we're comparing here the D25%, remember that D uh, parameter that, 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 that I showed before as the performance metric. Um, so the performance didn't even show up for the purely mechanics-based model. Um, and then, for the machine learning, the hybrid model, the one that's shown in the middle, that one actually performed the best. Uh, and if you go to the far right, that's the reduced order MLDD model. So that's the one where you're only using a small number of predictors, right? The performance is not as good as you would expect, but it's actually pretty decent. So one strategy could be 
it, that if you're in the if you're in the schematic design phase, um, you can and you just have information on maybe the number of stories, maybe the loading. You can get an estimate of what your drip demands would be. And as you move further into the design, maybe at the point where you're developing uh, structural models linked to do linear elastic analysis, then you can get a prediction from, say, the MLDD or MLEMKY models, which are which would give you a better better performance. Um, this slide uh, just gives a quick overview of sort of the predictive performance versus user, user effort. We're not even going to talk about the PSKY because that requires a lot of effort and gives you bad performance. The ML EMKY model gives you the best performance, but it requires a fair amount of effort on the part of the user. The reduced order MLDD model doesn't perform as well as the other two, but the effort required on the user is minimal. Now, again, because these models, these types of models cannot be written down like, like XGBoost, you don't have equations for a random forest model. So one of the things that we did with the goal of uh, developing tools to be used by practitioners, um, we built this web app that actually implements uh, uh, this, this drift demand prediction model based on the random forest. So I'm just going to play a short video here where um, it's just a video that's walking through. You select the number of stories. Uh, you put in your spectral parameters, uh, your loading information other information related to the number of bays, the bay width, and you can get a prediction of, of the drifts. Um, and you can get either a prediction for a single story or you can get a full profile, uh, a prediction for the full profile. Um, okay, so now I, okay, I didn't mean to do that. Okay, so now I'll move on to the last, um, the last uh, application which is predictive models of regional earthquake impact using uh, field reconnaissance data. As before, I am going to start with uh, a motivation, right? So, so it was mentioned earlier that obviously Peru is a seismically active uh, 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 country. I'm sure you've experienced uh, earthquakes before. Um, I, I'm not sure what the process is for um, assessing damage in, in Peru, but in the US, uh, this is typically done by in-person inspection. So earthquake happens, um, the building department would gather a set of volunteers that would go and do inspections in, in, in person, and they would document the damage um, along with other uh, characteristics. And they would tag the buildings, red, yellow, green, based on ATC 20. And this process can take, depending on the scale of the earthquake, on the order of weeks to months, right? And there's a lot of valuable information that's gathered during this process. So I'm in no way advocating that we that we get rid of this process. But the question becomes, can you use machine learning models to get rapid early information such that you can inform early recovery and planning? Uh, you can aid in the emergency response. You can enable rapid economic loss assessment so that you know where the needs are. Um, and so that you, you, you can also use it to prioritize the in-person inspections, right? Um, so we developed a, a, a classification model of earthquake-induced damage for building portfolios. Uh, we use a data set from the 2014 South Napa earthquake. This is some information about the earthquake. It was a magnitude six. Um, so, you know, it's, it was considered a moderate earthquake. The, the highest PGA was about 0.6 G. It damaged about 3,400 buildings, and the loss estimates range from, 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 from a half a billion to $1 billion. Um, this shows uh, the, the data set of uh, tagged buildings. Um, so if you're familiar with ATC20, the red tag means it's unsafe. The green tag means it's safe to occupy. The yellow means it's, it's, it's unclear sort of which side of the line it falls on, and it needs further information. So our goal was to build to build a predictive model um, to be able to predict these tags for the given building. And keeping in mind, whereas the previous two uh, examples were regression problems, this is actually a classification problem because we're trying to predict the state of damage of the building. So we looked at actually a, a, a few different ways of doing that. So one way is just using characteristics of the earthquake and the building. Right, so that's one type of model we developed. So what do I mean by that? 
Well, by that I mean things like the spectral intensity, the bore jointed distance, the BS30 or, or related to the soil properties, um, and also features related to the building. So the age, the number of stories, the value, whether it had plan irregularities um, and the floor area. Um, we looked at a few different models uh, to see uh, which of them work best. Um, we did our training testing split as we always do. The random forest model, which I described earlier, performed the best. And the strongest predictors, as you might expect, were the spectral intensity, uh, the bore joiner distance, and the, and the bore joiner distance and the age. Um, so this slide shows the results from the testing data set. Um, and so it's this is called a confusion matrix, um, and it's used to evaluate the performance of the model. So there are a few ways you can evaluate the performance. So one way is, is through what's called precision. And uh, precision is just the percentage of um, the percentage of predicted tags that are, that are correct, that, that have correct predictions, right? So the predictions are in the columns, right? So, 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 so the things that were predicted green are everything in the columns, but the one that's actually showing green is the only one that was actually green, right? So, so of, those of those green predictions that were, let's see, 141 plus 74 plus seven, about 64 of them percent of them were correct. Another way of evaluating is through what's called recall. So this one is the flip. So this one is the percentage of observed classes that was correctly predicted. So meaning, so for example, if you look at the, the buildings that were actually green tagged, that would be the 141 plus 121 buildings, right? And, and so of those, only, uh, only, only um, the 141 were, actual, were, were predicted as green. And so we predicted about 52% of the actual green tags as green. And then there's also accuracy, which is just the number of correct predictions normalized by uh, the total number of, of, of uh, data points. We also looked at another type of model where we actually used um, the description of damage uh, to do the, as, as the feature. Right, so I mentioned before, during the inspection, in addition to tagging the buildings, the inspectors actually document the description of damage. So what we did is we took those descriptions and we trained an uh, algorithm. It's a neural network algorithm, a deep learning algorithm. I talked a little bit about that earlier um, to, to be able to predict uh, the damage. And we actually got um, a, a better model compared to the other one, 86% uh, accuracy. Now the implication here is if you can if you can somehow have sort of written descriptions of damage that are documented to the field, say in some app, and you upload that to some uh, central location, then you can potentially get uh, information about sort of the initial information about the scale of damage and how it's distributed. Now the issue is what we did was we actually used the descriptions that were that was done as part of the conventional process um, in the prediction. So it sort of defeats the purpose because remember I said that overall process could take anywhere from weeks to a month to months, um, and it was actually generated by experts, right? So so the next question there, the natural question there is, okay, can descriptions generated by non-experts, meaning if you, people in their house, you're in your house, earthquake happens, you write what you see, can you get as good of models from non-experts as you get from experts? Because as experts, you know, we sort of, we know how to describe things, we know what to look for, we describe things using the same language. So it wasn't surprising that we got a good model from this. From, from this. So the question is, can you get a similar model from non-experts? And so I'm actually collaborating with a professor in the psychology department, where we're putting people uh, in a we're putting people um, in a VR environment. We're showing them earthquake damage. We're asking them to describe it, and then we're going to try to see if we can get uh, as good uh, predictive models from from those non-experts. Okay, um, some practical considerations for predictive models for regional earthquake impact assessment um, to get these things adopted broadly they would need to be incorporated into some user-friendly platform such as Shakecast, if you're familiar with USGS's Shakecast. Um, you, we just trained this model on a single data set. 
Um, I would not advise trying to do real predictions based on a model trained on a single earthquake, right? You want to create a multi-event data set. Um, you want to be able to compare um, the ML-based models with more traditional approaches like Hazus. Um, and then you also need to get buy-in from the local uh, building department or, or the state agencies. And so as promised, I'll wrap up with some final thoughts on some of the challenges with applying machine learning and earthquake engineering. Uh, one of the biggest challenges is the data sparsity, accessibility, and the overall quality, right? Um, as I mentioned before, if you take, for example, the, the regional um, damage prediction, that model was based on a single data set. And so, um, we need to collect many of many more of those types of data sets be, before we can start talking about um, having a model that we that we that we have confidence in, right? And and we also need to get better at sort of curating the data that we do we do collect uh, such that we have uh, trust in that data, because again, these machine learning models they're fully data dependent. So if the data is not good, the model is not going to be good. Um, we want to build consensus on the most appropriate methods for the field. As you've seen before, we're sort of in this stage where, depending on the application, we're trying different methods to see which ones work. I think we're starting to get a sense of which ones work in different contexts, but I think getting some sort of systematic uh, protocol in place for, okay, if it's this type of data, we think this type of model is useful, I think would, 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 would move us along. Um, I mentioned there are challenges with interpreting machine learning models, um, but again, keep in mind, there are some techniques that are used uh, to interpret them, especially uh, when it comes to sort of these neural network, these deep, deep learning models, those are much less difficult to, uh, to, to, to interpret. But for models like Random Forest and XGBoost, which are fairly intuitive um, if you if you spend some time staring at at, at at sort of how they work, trying to figure out how they work, they are actually pretty intuitive. So so and so you can develop sort of ways to be able to interpret those models. And then uh, issues with overfitting and lack lack of generality. Uh, machine learning models are good for interpolation, meaning they are good at predicting things within the range of the data. But once you start getting outside of the data they don't perform as well, right? So, so if you're gonna be using these models or if you're gonna be building these models and giving it to people to use, you have to be clear on sort of the range of application relative, relative, to, the, relative to the data. But also, as you saw earlier, creating some type of hybrid model that actually incorporates some of the physics of the problem uh, with the machine learning actually helps uh, with this issue of generality. And with that, I will end and uh, open up the floor for questions. Thank you very much, uh, Henry. It was a very nice presentation. And it was full of description and information. I was read, I was taking notes all the all the time. So thank you. I opened the uh, the room for questions from the audience. I don't know if anyone has a question. Uh, you could put it in the chat box, or you can raise your hand, and we can open the mic for you. Any question from the audience? I do have a question if you allow me, Henry. Uh, yes. You mentioned something very important, uh, in my opinion, uh, when you talk about the availability of data. Yes. It's kind of difficult because we generally don't collect or gather together so many data of, in infrastructure in general. I mean, there are a lot of data, but it's, it's most of the time kept within the construction company or the constructors yeah. or the county or the building managers. So what do you think we should have to do to actually start to, I don't know, advocate for collecting and uh, showing data from infrastructure? Yeah, that's a really good question. So so first of all, so let me, let me first tackle um, sort of, if we're talking about say an earthquake happened, um, you know, I think there's there's a long history of researchers going out and doing reconnaissance and collecting data. And now here within the U.S., um, we have uh, NSF has has uh, has created a center. Um, the um, it's called NERI, and part of that uh, one arm of that is called Design Safe, 
and that's basically a platform for sort of collecting and curating data. Another uh, part of that center is Rapid, where you have access to different types of uh, uh, equipment for collecting data, things like drones and 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 boats that 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 um, that 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 do lidar scanning and all types of things. Um, and so here in the U.S., we're actually at least on the on the research side, we're starting to see sort of things being systems being put in place to be able to collect um, data. Now, I think there's still some thinking needs to be done in terms of curation and making sure that the way we're collecting the data is in a way that can be used by these types of models. But I think we're it's in a step in the right direction. So the challenge you talked about has more to do with private data, I guess. Um, and sort of how do we how do we incentivize people to get access? And, and this is something that I've actually been thinking about. Um, and what I think it boils down to is that we have to somehow find a way to incentivize uh, private owners to give access to the data. Well, one, we have to ensure them where privacy is a concern. We have to ensure them that the data is in an anonymized enough such that, you know, if there are any security issues, that's that's addressed. So that's that's one of the big things. But then the, the, but then the other question you have to say, well, what you, they will ask is, well, what am I benefiting from, right, by giving you this data? And, and, and so one thing you can think about, imagine you have this hub of, this hub of data that's in the cloud, right? It, it has the right sort of um, um, cybersecurity things to restrict uh, uh, private information, but it's it's a data set that, that comes from a lot of different private agencies, right? And then you might say, well, if you wanna have access to this large database, then you have to be willing to put in the database. You know, you, will, you have to be willing to add to this database uh, to be able to get access to it. Right, so that could be one way of incentivizing it, but I think the sort of privacy and security issue is one that 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 we'd have to be willing to tackle because I think that's going to be something that's paramount um, um, for for a lot of these uh, private agencies. Well, thank you very much. I, I have another one if you allow me. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Regarding also, you mentioned something about the interpretation of results. Yes. Uh, as you mentioned, I and I, you presented. It seems like many people won't actually understand the results. I mean, directly the result from machine learning models. Yes. Yes. It might require like a kind of special training or like a kind of next generation of structural engineers to get into that and to open it to the public. What do you think about it? Or is yeah? Like so that's a really good question. Um, another one that I've been I've been thinking about. So. In terms of, so there's building the models and then there's sort of using it and interpreting it, right? So I think in terms of building the models, certainly I would, I would um, advocate for um, uh, civil engineers in general um, in both undergraduate and graduate curriculum starting to having these techniques being part of that curriculum. In fact, here at UCLA, we recently in introduced a course on um, uh, artificial intelligence for civil engineering. So this is civil engineering in general, not just uh, natural hazards or earthquakes. Um, and so that's a course that's being taught and it's actually a course that's cross-listed, meaning both undergrads and grads can take it. So I think if you're gonna be building these types of models, I think you need to have that type of exposure um, in, a, in a formal setting. Um, now, if you're going to be using the model, I don't know that the the bar for sort of understanding how they work is as high. I think the, the I think the 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 onus is on us as the user, as the builders, to develop um, sort of tools and information. Like, say, I don't know if you're still seeing my slide, but like this type of th these types of things that would actually allow visually that would allow say someone who is using the model to visually see how the different variables are affecting whatever the outcome is right I, i've been i've been ha I've, I've actually been having this really interesting discussion with professor wallace um because you know you always hear engineers say you know i like my analytical equation because you know i can see you know i can see whether or not if i increase this variable this is how my drift capacity is increased or maybe it might increase by the square of this variable or whatever, I see it, right? It's, and, and my argument is, 
if, if we can create visualization tools that can communicate the same information, I would argue that it, it's, it, it, it becomes even more interpretable because I think I would argue that looking at a plot and seeing how a particular variable sort of interacts with the response outcome um, I don't know. To me, it, I would argue it's more intuitive than looking at at a set of numbers. Um, but I think I think the jury is still out on that, and I think there's there's a lot of there's a lot of um, uh, great discussions and debates that are that are going to need to be had about that. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a question here from Marcela Yekle. Uh, how can civil engineers use can can use this important tool to actually improve households? and structures in Peru, for example, knowing the most of these structures are not well designed. Yeah, that's a good, oh, that's a good question. Um, so, so I guess we, so we want to, so we want to, first we want to say, well, what problem are we trying to tackle, right? So if the problem is improving, the, if, if the problem is improving designs, I'm not sure how, I mean, there are, so, so for example, if we're talking about improving designs and you can say, well, you know, maybe we can improve the designs by finding new materials that are, that, that are cost effective, but perform well, right? I have a colleague here at UCLA, uh, Matthew Bauchi, who actually uses machine learning to try to discover new materials that can be used in civil infrastructure systems, right? So that type of problem you can tackle um, um, using machine learning, assuming that sort of improving the material is a way to sort of do the improvement. Um, now, if we're talking about, say, um, in the aftermath of an earthquake, then as I showed earlier, you know, there are ways that you can use this machine learning models to sort of get better information earlier that can sort of help with the recovery process and just with planning um, the emergency response. But again, that, 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 that does, that's not related to the design. I think maybe the person's questions was, was more specific about the design. I, I think so. Uh, another question from Gerald Palomino. Well, first he said, hi, Professor Barton. Nice presentation, very illustrative applications. Some questions. Uh, what kind of software are you using for this work in machine learning? How efficient are they? Okay, and the second question is for third application, uh, what are the advantages of using machine learning approach over using a software that can perform risk assessment like OpenQuake? Really good. Two really good questions. Um, so the first question about the software. So, so, so we're using, so to be able to build these machine learning models, you need some type of, you need some type of uh, statistical software. So, so we actually use Python. And Python is good because it has all these open source libraries. So for example, if we're, we're implementing random forests, while, while, I, while, I, while I make sure that my, my students understand how random forest XGBoost work, and as part of the classes they take, they, 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 they often have to code these things up. Um, if you use Python, you actually have libraries of these different models that you can use that are open source. Right, so that's so that's the first so so that's the answer to the first question. We're using Python. I imagine you can also use R and even MATLAB. In in some cases, I've had some some students use MATLAB for this work, but I would say we primarily use Python. The second question. So this is a really good one. So 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 what's the advantage of using machine learning versus sort of the traditional? So so we've developed this workflow over the years of doing risk assessment. And you mentioned OpenQuake has us does this has us does it a similar way. Um, so you have your you have your hazard, you get your shaking intensities. From your shaking intensities, you have some type of model that gets you to response and then to damage and to losses. So let's let's look at going from hazard to damage. If you look at so 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 if you understand how these things work, these are based on fragilities, right? So so fragilities basically get you from shaking intensity to the probability of being in some damage state. Where do those for those fragilities come from? Well, if you look at hazards, they're somewhat based on some a little bit of physics. Like there's this thing called the advanced uh, um, the advanced engineering building model that uses sort of this. Um, it uses the the response spectrum and the capacity curve to get you the response 
those things are very simplistic representations of the actual response of the, of the, of the structure. So, you know, so you often have people ask the question of, well, we have physics-based relationships to represent these things. Why, why, why are we looking at using machine learning? Well, the answer is, in a lot of times, we're, we're, we're simplifying the physics to the point where, you know, it's almost, it's, it's almost like we're almost removing a lot of the physics in that process, right? So you can argue that. And then the other thing is, a lot of these uh, fragility curves are calibrated by empirical data anyway. Right, so in a lot of cases, they're either fully empirical models or they're partially empirical models. So once you start getting into empirical models, then then there's really no argument against at least exploring the possibility of machine learning as a way to improve these these empirical models. Right, so you know I think that's sort of a long-winded answer, but I think you sort of have to look at the different stages of this risk assessment, and you sort of have to look at the techniques that are being used. And if there's sort of expert, if there's sort of domain knowledge, physics that's being used, how much is it being simplified? And if it's being simplified a lot, or if it's empirical anyway, then again, I would argue that you might as well explore uh, using machine learning. Sorry, I think maybe, maybe it may have been longer than you were asking. Uh, thank you very much. There is a, a one question here from Eric Lino. Have you tried to use another machine learning algorithm? such as logistic regression, support vector machine, or did you go directly to XGBoost? I think it's referred to the first application. Yeah, that's a good question. So, so I think in all of our applications, we've, we've started by, by, by comparing a bunch of different models. So we've, we've looked at uh, support vector machines before. Um, I think on one of my slides in, in, the, in the very last slide, um, not the very last slide, but one of the very last study, I talked about the fact that we explored using uh, uh, Q, QDA, quadratic discriminant analysis, uh, K nearest neighbors. So in general, we, we, we start by exploring different um, types of models. But as I mentioned in my last slide, at some point we have to start learning about learning. <laughs> and by that, I mean, we start, we, we need to, when we, when we sort of do this exploration and we decide, okay, this model works, we sort of need to start documenting that so that the next person doing it doesn't have to try everything um, the next the next time around. Okay, thank you. And I think it's very related to what you said about the, the half kind of guideline, guideline for using machine learning in a structural engineering application. Mm -hmm. I think one more question, but it's more related to what kind of literature would you recommend for this topic? We have a lot of students and they are interested, so they are hmm. asking what kind of reference would you have? I know you are publishing a lot, so maybe that can help. Yeah, yeah. So I think looking at publications help. So we actually published, uh, we recently published a paper, uh, a, a state of the art paper, and, and, and I don't know if you have it, but I'd be happy to share it with you. Um, um, and it's funny. So in that paper, so so we do a state, we review the literature and sort of structural applications in machine learning. But in addition to doing that, we actually went through the detailed formulation of the various models that have been applied, right? So we actually go through the math. And it's interesting because when we <laughs> when we were when the paper was being reviewed, one of the reviewers were like, why are you putting all of this math in here? If, they, if, 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 if someone wants to know the math, they'll just go look at the reference. And our, and our opinion was, like, was that, you know, for people that are in our field, I, we thought it would be beneficial to have both the applications and the math in one location. Um, so, so, so I think that paper is probably a good place to start. But also in that paper, we reference a lot of um, other sort of um, other publications sort of within the realm of, of, of machine learning, like the people that actually develop these algorithms that I think you'd be able, you would find useful as well. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a free book uh, that, that's by an author, his last name is Murphy. I don't remember his first name, but it's one that a lot of people use because it's available for free. And it's also cited in, in that paper that we published. So. Um, there's a lot of resources out there, but I think the Murphy book is a, a really good good starting point. Okay, uh, one last question, uh, I think, uh, is from Natalie Yorikasa. I would like to know what difficulties you 
have encountered in your research, I mean, I think using this machine learning algorithm, and what will be the points or topics to investigate further to complement that current research? Oh, good question. Um, I think one is, I mentioned, I mean, some of it is sort of just inferred from this, this last slide, right? Um, so for example, um, a lot of, a lot of what we're doing now, we're just, it's just based on, on individual data sets. So for example, if I take this model that I built with the Napa earthquake and I try to apply it to say Northridge, how would it perform? Or if I combine the two data, data sets and built a model, how would that perform? Um, I think a lot of the advances um, would come from being able to get diff different data sets and see which models perform well. But I think this idea of uh, data fusion and building models that actually fuse different types of data is one that I'm particularly interested in. So for example, I showed this slide um, that um, where first we use building characteristics as the predictors, then we use written damage description. So that's that field is, it's, it's a field called natural language processing. We also tried to develop a model with images that didn't work out well because I didn't think we had the right number of images. There's this field of machine learning that I think we in earthquake engineering haven't started to explore yet called uh, multimodal machine learning. So that's where you're fusing different types of uh, features to create a single model. So for example, you can combine uh, written text with images to create a unified set of features and, 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 and to create a single model. I think that's, that's actually super interesting. But I think, but I think, you know, if within your sort of local context, I think just getting the right data sets and starting to explore what you can do with them, I think is, is, is a good starting point. Well, thank you very much, Henry. Uh, thank you very much to the audience for the good questions. I would like to uh, give the, the space to Dr. Flores for the final words on this webinar and then we can conclude the, the webinar. Please, Dr. Flores. Dear Dr. Barton, thank you very much uh, for this uh, actually really interesting presentation. I was uh, particularly interested in uh, the classification problem. I, I, I was not thinking about the classification point of view, like seeing this uh, infrastructure and, and where to focus resources. We are a resources trapped country and uh, being able to quickly, uh, with uh, information from uh, non-professional uh, uh, professional people who are going to have the time to travel to different towns to assess damage, uh, if we could have a, a tool uh, so that by either, I don't know, satellite pictures or images from the TV, we could assess damage quickly. Uh, I think that would be amazing. Of course, I would be very interested in trying to uh, solve this problem using uh, very limited uh, data sets because mm -hmm. here in Peru, we don't have large data sets and machine learning yeah. usually requires large uh, data sets, which yeah. unfortunately we don't have. But uh, it's been uh, uh, very, really uh, eye-opening, uh, your presentation. Thank you very much for sharing this with, with us. I'm sure uh, very... Uh, many people from uh, who are uh, joining us today uh, have uh, uh, are, are going back home with uh, new ideas and, and uh, ways to uh, think about uh, earthquake uh, engineering and uh, new ways in which we can apply uh, machine learning for this. So uh, once again, thank you very much for taking the time to share this uh, information with us. I think everybody has uh, enjoyed uh, probably even more than me. Uh, but uh, but uh, I do appreciate that, and uh, I hope uh, one day in the future we can actually have these uh, webinars, not webinars, but seminars uh, uh, here here in Peru, and uh, we're going to welcome you then. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bertrand, for this. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Flores. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Barton. It was an honor to have this webinar. I think it was very interesting, and. Uh, on behalf of the University of Technology and Engineering, UTEC, we would like to thank you for this webinar and thank you to the audience.
I think that will be all. And see you next time. Don't forget, please, to join us in the next uh, events we have scheduled during the rest of the year. And please all stay safe and take care of the health.